Welcome to our 19th Prophecy Seminar. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the promise that your Holy Spirit will help us understand it. And as we dig into one of the stories in Daniel today, may our hearts be open. We want to be faithful to you and to follow you, and we pray that your Spirit will guide us as we're studying. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, it's time for our quiz. Number one, true or false, when a wicked person dies, he goes straight to hell. Well, that's false. The Bible says that they sleep in the grave until the resurrection at the end of the thousand years. Number two, true or false, since God doesn't like the smell of hell, he has put Satan in charge of poking people into the fire. No, that's false also. Number three, true or false, hellfire totally consumes and destroys the wicked as they attempt to attack the holy city at the end of the thousand years. That's true. Number four, True or false, the wicked are destroyed in the fires of hell, but Satan cannot be destroyed because he is a spirit creature. No, that's false. Remember, the Bible said that Satan is also thrown into the fires of hell and is completely burned up to ashes. Number five, the doctrine of an eternally burning hell comes straight from ancient paganism and not from the Bible. That's true. You know, Satan knew that if he could get us to believe that God tortures people in hell for eternity, it would misrepresent what God is really like, and it would make him look like a cruel, vengeful being. Satan knew that if he could paint that picture of God, many would turn away in disgust and hatred. But really, they're turning away from a false picture of God, not from the true picture that's given in the Bible. You know, for the last 18 seminars, we've been looking at various stories and prophecies and how the stories in the book of Daniel illustrate the prophecies. We've seen that those stories help us to understand what's going to be happening at the end of time. Before we move into the next section of the book of Daniel, we need to back up and take a look at the first chapter again. So I want to read with you the whole chapter. It's not that long. Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 1. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his god. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong and healthy, good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were, were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. 
But Daniel determined, was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now, the chief of, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has ordered you to eat his, this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. Wow, that's quite a story. We've probably heard it since we were little kids, but it's still an amazing story. And Nebuchadnezzar was an amazing king. Not many kings would take their prisoners and feed them from their own table and educate them to be leaders in his kingdom. And yet Daniel and his three friends decided that even though Nebuchadnezzar was being so generous of a king, they were going to refuse his generous offer, no matter what the results might be. Why did they do that? Daniel 1 and verse 8 tells us that it said Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given, them to, given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat those unacceptable foods. That word defile is a very strong word. It means to pollute, to stain, to desecrate. Daniel and his three friends were determined that they were not going to pollute or stain or, or defile themselves by eating or drinking what the king was offering them. Now, what would make them think that the food and the drink that the king was offering would be a problem? Why would they think that would defile them? Well, they were studying God's word, what they had of it, and they would have known what King Solomon had written in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, Wine produces mockers, alcohol leads to brawls, those led astray by drink cannot be wise. And there's also this in Proverbs 31 verses 4 and 5. It is not for kings to drink wine, <clears throat> nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. 
Have you ever been to a party or an event where others were drinking and you weren't? Have you noticed as the evening wore on how people acted as the alcohol began to affect their brain? Daniel knew and his friends knew that if they drank the wine the king offered them, they would not be able to think clearly. They knew that God had told kings and princes not to drink or they would not be able to properly listen to God's laws and follow his directions. And he and his friends not only wanted to be good students and good learners, they not only wanted to be good leaders, they also wanted to make sure that they could clearly discern God's will and voice. They did not want to be led astray by the tremendous pressures and temptations they were going to be facing there in pagan Babylon. Daniel and his three friends knew, didn't know about the tests that they were going to face. They just knew they wanted to be faithful. They didn't know about the fiery furnace. That was in the future. They didn't know about the lion's den that would be coming. That was in the future. They just knew they wanted to be faithful. And if they had not made this choice, if they had not made this choice, this simple choice at the beginning, well, it wasn't simple, was it? It was a difficult choice. If they had not made this difficult choice at the beginning, they would not have been faithful when those bigger tests came later on. Okay, you say, but that works for alcohol and wine that the king was offering, but why would Daniel refuse the king's food? I mean, what's wrong with food? You've got to eat. Well, let's look at another one of the books of the Bible that Daniel and his friends would have studied and based their beliefs on. It's Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 11, starting in verse 1. This is something, remember, that Daniel and his friends would have known. They would have studied this and understood this. Daniel chapter, uh, Leviticus chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Of all the land animals, these are the ones you may use for food. You may eat any animal that has completely split hooves and chews the cud. You may not, however, eat the following animals that have split hooves or that chew the cud, but not both. The camel chews the cud. You know what chewing the cud is, right? Any of you that have been around cows, I used to milk cows every day, and, and the cow would stand there, and they'd already eaten their food, and then they would kind of regurgitate it and chew it and then swallow it again. That's chewing the cud. The Bible says the camel chews the cud, but does not have split hooves, so it's ceremonially, ceremonially unclean for you. The hyrax chews the cud, but does not have split hooves, so it is unclean. The hare chews the cud, but does not have split hooves, so it's unclean. The pig has evenly split hooves, but does not chew the cud, so it is unclean. You may not eat the meat of these animals or even touch their carcasses. They are ceremonially unclean to, for you. This passage in Leviticus goes on and it talks about what kinds of seafood are clean and what are unclean. It talks about what kind of birds are okay to eat and what are not okay to eat. It talks about which ones God calls clean and which ones he calls unclean and tells them not to eat. Probably you and I have never been tempted to eat camels or horses or mice, or cats, or dogs, or snakes, or hawks, or owls. But they do eat them in many countries. And Daniel knew that some of those things, along with pigs and rabbits and shellfish, would surely have been included in the food that the king was offering them. So Daniel went to the person in charge of their care and asked for a vegetarian diet and water instead of the food and drink that the king was providing. 
Some translations say he asked for pulse, and others say he asked for vegetables. The word, the word pulse or vegetables, the word there in the Hebrew means something planted or sown. It probably included vegetables and fruits as well as grains and nuts. When God told Moses to write down these directions in Leviticus, he didn't tell them why they shouldn't eat those things. Certain foods, animals, birds, seafoods. He didn't tell them why. He just called those things unclean and told them not to eat them. But today, much research has shown that those items that God called unclean are the most unhealthful things we can eat. In fact, science has shown that the absolute healthiest way to live is to eat the vegetarian diet Daniel and his friends requested. It was maybe sort of like the Mediterranean diet. Not totally, but sort of like the Mediterranean diet. It was a vegetarian diet. In fact, science has shown us that those who eat a vegetarian diet live longer and healthier than others. They don't have the numbers of diseases, cancers, and other things that other people get. They still get some, but nowhere near the numbers. We live in a sinful world, and we're not going to avoid all of that, but a vegetarian diet is the most healthy diet that, that there is. And science has shown what God had already shown his people and what Daniel was asking for. Not only is it healthier for us humans, but it's, but it's also better for the environment. So maybe it shouldn't surprise us that when God told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he gave them a vegetarian diet. Look what he says in Genesis 1 and verse 29. Then God said, Look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. God wasn't being arbitrary when he commanded people not to eat those unclean types of animals and sea creatures and birds. He was simply doing what was best for them. He wasn't telling just the Jews not to eat those things. Look at what... Look at when God first talked about clean and unclean animals. It's in Genesis 7, starting in verse 1. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate. Way back at the time of the flood, long before Abraham, long before the children of Israel, people already knew which animals God called clean and which ones he called unclean. It hadn't been written down yet, but God had told them and they knew about the clean and unclean animals. Look at what the prophet Isaiah wrote years later in Isaiah chapter Sorry about that. I'm getting mixed up on my slides, but you, you know the picture of, of Noah and the flood and the ark and, and the animals coming in by sevens and twos. So now let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 17. He said, Those who consecrate and purify themselves in a sacred garden with its idol in the center, feasting on pork and rats and other detestable meats, will come to a terrible end, says the Lord. There in Isaiah, God puts idol worship in the same category, along with eating pork and rats and other detestable things. He says that those who do those things will come to a terrible end. Daniel probably knew 
of Isaiah's prophecies. He probably had a copy of what he had written out and had read that as well. Now I can almost hear someone saying, but what about Peter's vision? Doesn't that change things? And that's a good question. You can find the story in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius was a Roman army officer or centurion. He was not a Jew, but he was a believer in God, and God sent an angel to talk to Cornelius. Cornelius was doing what he could to support the Jews and doing all he could to faithfully follow whatever God told him to do. So this angel comes to Cornelius and tells him to send men to Joppa to find a man named Peter. He even tells Cornelius exactly where Peter is staying. So Cornelius sends three men to Joppa, to the house of Simon the Tanner, to find a man named Peter. Now, let's pick up the story in Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 9. The next day, Cornelius's messengers were nearing, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And here you can see Peter sleeping there on the, on the flat roof. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter! kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. But the voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times, then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Now, if we stopped right there, if we stopped right there, it would be easy to believe that God was saying this business about clean and unclean meat is no longer an issue. It sounds like God is saying it's okay to eat anything now. And that's what many Christians believe, but that's because they don't read the rest of the story. Let, let's go on with the rest of the verse. Peter Peter was perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. S standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, Peter was, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry. For I have sent them. You know, according to the Jews, according to the way Peter had been raised all his life, it would have been wrong for him to go down and touch those men. It would have been wrong for him to invite them into the house. It would have been wrong for him to eat with them. They were considered uncircumcised, unclean. But after this vision, Peter invited them in to spend the night, and the next day he went with them to the house of Cornelius. And here's what Peter said as he came into this unclean Roman army officer's house. It's going on in verse 28. Peter told them, You know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me What had God shown him? God had shown him that vision of the sheet and the animals. He says, God has shown me not anything about food. He says, God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now, tell me why you sent for me. Peter was very clear now. The vision had nothing to do with what he ate or didn't eat. It was to tell him that it was wrong to think of non-Jews 
as unclean. So Peter stayed with this Roman, non-Jew, unclean family for a number of days. He lived with them. He ate with them. He preached to them, studied with them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit just like he and the other disciples had been at Pentecost. And after that, Peter baptized them. But news travels fast. And look what happened a few days later when Peter got back to Jerusalem. Acts chapter 11 and verse 2. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them, they said. Then Peter told them exactly what happened. I was in the town of Joppa, he said, and while I was praying, I went into a trance and I saw a vision. Something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners from the sky and it came right down to me. When I looked inside the sheet, I saw all sorts of tame and wild animals, reptiles and birds, and I heard a voice say, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, I replied, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. But the voice from heaven spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. This happened three times before the sheet and all it contained was pulled back up to heaven. Just then, three men who had been sent from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were staying. The Holy Spirit told me to go with them and not to worry that they were Gentiles. Again, it's clear that Peter now understood the vision to be talking about how he relates to other people, not about what he should eat or not eat. And that's a good lesson for us as we study the Bible in other areas too. We need to make sure that we carefully look at the entire passage and all the verses related to it. If we aren't careful, it's possible to take one text here and one text there and twist the meaning to say what we want it to say. This vision wasn't talking about what people ate or didn't eat. It was talking about how we relate to other people that we may think of as unclean or unworthy, but God sees them as his children. There are a few other texts in the Bible that people have used to justify eating whatever they might want to eat today. We don't have time to go into all of those texts right now. But when you study them and see the context and the other texts relating to them, it becomes clear that they're not saying what people have tried to make them say. There's an exhibit that goes along with the review lesson for this seminar. And, and if you look at that exhibit, it carefully goes through those texts. If you haven't already gotten that, then make sure that you email me at danielseminar at northlakesda.com and I'll be happy to send you that, that review lesson with the exhibit and you can study it there at home. We have seen in Daniel and Revelation that we're in the final segments of Earth's history. Satan is working tremendous deceptions, trying to get all of the world to quit following God and follow him. We want to make sure we're not deceived. So it's more important than ever before that we keep our minds clear so that we can hear the voice of God, so that we can follow his word. Back in seminar number five, we studied about the image that Daniel's three friends were ordered to bow down to. When they refused, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And in that seminar, number five, we also studied how it was an illustration of something that would happen at the end of time. We won't take time to review that today, but you can go back and look at seminar number five or the review lesson for seminar number five and refresh your memory about an end time deception that tries to get all of the world to worship an image, 
to the beast in Revelation. The point is, these three young men who joined Daniel in refusing to eat the king's unclean food and to drink his wine, they were the only ones who passed the big test when it came later on. The test about the image and the fiery furnace. Could it be that here at the end of time, God is using a small or not so small test on what we eat, on our diet, to help us, to help get us so that we are ready for his tremendous deceptions that Satan is using diet to try and get us to be ready for his tremendous deceptions. And God is using this little test to try and help us be ready to avoid those tremendous deceptions. Just like Daniel and his friends, we need our minds to be clear. We need our bodies to be healthy if we're going to be able to resist the deceptions of Satan here at the end of time. By the way, do you remember what was the first test that was given to Adam and Eve? They were perfect. There was no sin in or around them. But they were given one small test. It's in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. There in the midst of all that beauty and joy and happiness and the wonderful things God had given them, there was one restriction placed on them. It was to see if they would listen to God and obey Him, even if they didn't understand all the reasons why. And that one small test was based on diet. They were not to eat from one tree in the garden. You know the story of what happened. They believed Satan's lies. They ate the fruit. And sin and misery and death have been a part of this world ever since. It was such a little thing. Just, just what they ate or didn't eat. But it demonstrated whether they were willing to totally trust God and do what he said in all areas of life. 2,000 years later, Jesus, sometimes called the second Adam, Jesus came and and he was fasting and praying out in the wilderness and Satan was desperately trying to tempt him. Do you remember what that very first temptation was? It's in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 2. For 40 days and 40 nights he, that's Jesus, fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God... Tell these stones to become loaves of bread. You remember, God had already told Jesus, this is, had said at his baptism, this is my beloved son. Now Satan is trying to get him to distrust what God had already said. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Adam and Eve had failed when Satan used a temptation based on appetite and food to see if they would be faithful to God or not. And there in the wilderness, the very first temptation that Satan brought was again using appetite to see if he could get Jesus to show distrust in God. The Apostle Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You know, non-Christians might choose to eat and drink in a healthy way so that they can live longer and happier and healthier lives. 
But for us Christians, there's an even greater reason to choose those things. We are here on earth to give glory to God in all that we do. And that includes accepting restrictions that he might place on us for whatever reason. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul puts that same concept this way. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. Isn't that amazing? God considers our bodies to be His temple, His dwelling place. The Holy Spirit lives in us. How could we choose to do anything that would defile or corrupt the temple He has created? How can we drink anything that would deaden our minds or twist our thinking so that we might miss or misinterpret the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us? How can we eat or smoke or drink or dress or live in any way that would shorten this life that God has given us to give glory and honor to Him? Speaking of that, let me take you to the country of Yemen for our special feature today. Yemen is a rugged country with villages built in all kinds of settings. Cold streams come down from the mountains and there are lots of sheep and goats. And that means shepherds, some old and some young. We also saw this young man washing out hand-woven oriental carpets in one of the streams. There are many fascinating sites in Yemen. If it wasn't so filled with war right now, it's a, a fascinating place to visit. One of those places is Dar al-Hajr. That, that is called, usually in English, the, the Rock Palace. It was built in the 1920s, and you can see why it was called the Rock Palace. It was built in the 1920s as a summer retreat for the ruler of Yemen at the time. It's about 15 kilometers outside the capital city of Sana'a. Sana'a is a fascinating city. It's made of, of uniquely painted mud bricks. Many of the buildings are several stories tall, and as you look out over them, it seems like everyone has a satellite dish. Inside the houses, they're often ornately decorated. This is a visiting room located just inside the door of every home. It's the only place where males who are not part of the family are allowed to come in a home, in a Muslim home. Now, you've probably guessed already that I love the marketplaces in the Middle East. That doesn't mean I'm ready to eat everything that comes from them, at least not directly, but they're fascinating places to visit. There in Sana'a, there's a river that runs through the city. But they decided it's dry most of the year, and they didn't want to waste the space com coming through the city for this big river. So they, they built walls along the sides of it. And during most of the year, it's a highway. People drive filled with cars, but let a rainstorm begin up in the mountains and it quickly empties of cars and the gates are shut to the, to the walls and the side streets and the river can rush down through the, the city with, hopefully without hurting anything. As you know from the news, Yemen has been going through a terrible time of war. This picture is from before the current war, but you can still probably see some of the bullet holes and, and 
mortar holes in some of the buildings even back then. It shows that for many years Yemen has periodically gone through times of war as the different groups would be fighting with each other. And in any war, I don't care where it is, I don't care what the reason is for it, in any war it's the people that suffer. There are good people on both sides. There are people who just want to live their lives in peace. They want to raise their sons. They want to run their businesses. They want to be better, better mothers. They want to learn skills that will help them help their families. And kids are kids everywhere. Kids shouldn't have to grow up watching wars or fighting in wars. The Yemeni people are a beautiful people and my heart aches for what they're going through. But they have another problem besides war. Even though Yemen is a rugged country, it still has quite a lot of good farmland. The problem is, some studies have shown that 60% of the tillable farmland is used to raise cot instead of food. Cot, what is cot? Probably, it's called by different names in different countries, but throughout that part of the world, it's something that, that they use a lot. It's a leafy green tree whose leaves cause a mild high when you chew them. Sometimes it's even hallucinogenic. 90% of the men and 50 to 70% of the women chew cot on a daily basis. They'll gather in groups and sit for three or four hours at a time just chewing and talking and spacing out. You can see the lump can, can you see the lump in his cheek with the cot that he's chewing? I can't quite do it. The, they take this wad of leaves and put it in there and chew it, and then it begins to make them high. Even 15 to 20 percent of children under the age of 12 chew it on a daily basis. But the problem isn't just the narcotic effects or the associated cancers and other conditions that are caused by it. It's not just the 60% of the tillable land that's used to raise it. It's not just the 30% of the available water that's used to raise cot. It's not just the tremendous amount of money that these poor families spend on something that does them absolutely no good. The problem is also the children who spend hours a day alone while their parents sit together and chew cot. They have to amuse themselves, they learn what they can from those around them, and many times it isn't good. Yemen is a totally, almost totally Muslim country. And you know that Muslims don't drink alcohol or eat pork. They believe God has commanded people not to do those things. But they have no concept of our bodies being the temples of God. They don't realize that God has told us these things to make us healthier, to make our minds clearer, to let us show the honor and glory of God. So they still eat camels and smoke tobacco and chew cot. What a difference it would make in their lives if they, would re if they could realize that the Holy Spirit wants to live in them, wants to use them to bring honor and glory to Him, and that these things are not just an arbitrary command or restriction, but they're for our good. Daniel and his three friends chose to be faithful to God. They ate the healthy diet that God originally gave to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And when the king examined them at the end of their study, he found them ten times smarter than everyone else. But even more than that, 
Their lives were a constant witness for God. And when the great tests came, they were able to hear God's voice and stand firm no matter what the outcome might be. If you believe that God wants his last day people to live healthy lives and have clear minds, would you raise your hand? I can't see you, but I'm sure that you do believe that. If you want to glorify God in your body by leaving out of your life anything like pork or alcohol or tobacco or anything else that would reduce your health and deaden your mind, would you stand with me wherever you are? Let's pray together. Oh, Father God, you haven't told us these things just to be arbitrary. You've told us because you want what's best for us. You want us to be healthy and happy and holy people. You want us to have wonderful, blessed lives and avoid the diseases and the troubles that come from many of these dietary practices. But Lord, you also want us to bring glory and honor to your name. And today we want to follow you. We pray that your spirit will come into our lives, that you will give us the desire, and that you will give us the power to conquer the things in our lives that need conquering, that you will help us to surrender every area of our life to you and be willing to stand for you like Daniel and his friends, no matter what the outcome might be. Oh Lord, send your spirit and your angels to help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Next month, we'll have our 20th prophecy seminar. It's called, What if Nebuchadnezzar were converted today? And our special feature? Well, I'm not going to tell you today what the special feature is. It's going to be a secret. I know what it is. It's not that I haven't made up my mind yet, but I haven't decided whether I can tell you where the country is or not. It may not be safe for me to share with you the details of the stories and pictures that I'm going to show to you next time. So you'll have to watch next month and see. Maybe I'll have decided by then that I can share with you where it is, or maybe we will just say it's a veiled city. When we call it a veiled city, we mean it's a location that we can't share openly without creating risk for God's work and his people who are living there. But you can watch next time and, and see what it is at that point. That'll be on Sabbath, June 26. It'll be at 1.30. And don't forget, if you have questions or would like one of the review, seminar, review lessons that go with this seminar, please email me at danielseminar at northlakesda.com. And I would also like to add, if, if you're struggling with a special need, if you need help in overcoming smoking or changing your diet and lifestyle in some way, if you want your body to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, but you need help, email me. I'll put you in contact with someone who can help you through whatever the issue is that you're struggling with. May God be with you.